welcome to our service today. Thanks for watching. And today we're going to have a special message focusing on Jesus Christ coming into the world. Here everybody's thinking about the birth of Jesus and the light which God said, let there be light come into this world. And Jesus is that light and he was born. He's the light of the world. And today we're going to give you a fascinating study on how the birth of Jesus had so many elements involved with it that parallel with his resurrection. And we're going to especially focus on the kingdom emphasis of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Praise God. Thanks for being with us. Don't forget to subscribe and put a thumbs up if you haven't already subscribed. And we're going to have a great time just getting into the word of the Lord together. And we're going to start with some worship here first. And Lord bless you. And let's give God praise and worship as we move into this time of the service. It's time for our offering. And if you'd like to give to our ministry, and this is a blessing to you, you can do so by e-transfer or PayPal at bolm.portage at gmail.com or paypal.me slash breathoflifechurch. We really appreciate your giving and it goes toward the work of this ministry. Thanks and God bless. Very day. 
We're going to begin by going to Matthew chapter 1 and getting right into the scripture and reveal all the elements that point to his resurrection because it's all about the kingdom that Jesus Christ is currently right now ruling over. So let's go to Matthew chapter 1 and the 18th verse and we read, Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise, when as his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privily. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, Fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived of her is of the Holy Ghost. Now notice it's emphasizing the fact that Joseph was of the tribe of that David belonged to, Judah. Mary was also from that tribe. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And what's so wonderful about that is the name Jesus means God is salvation. So that's why it says, call his name God is salvation, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. And what's interesting is that Emmanuel is explained to mean God with us right here. But we just read that he would be called Jesus. So why would they call his name Emmanuel according to the prophets? And why would it say that this was done, naming him Jesus, to fulfill the prophecy that his name would be called Emmanuel, being God with us? Well, Jesus means God is my salvation. So it comes in two parts. God, and that's what Emmanuel means, God with us. But Jesus is God salvation. So he's actually with us for the purpose of salvation. And that's how the name Jesus fulfills the naming of the child to be Emmanuel, being God with us. He's God with us for salvation. Then Joseph being raised from sleep did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him and took unto him his wife and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son and he called his name Jesus. Wonderful, wonderful introduction to why Jesus would be called that name. Now, when we get to Luke chapter 2, and we're going to see a lot of references here in Luke 2, and drop way down to verse 21, the Bible tells us that after Jesus was born, it was a span of eight days 
before Mary took him to be circumcised. And you read, when eight days were accomplished for the circumcising of the child, his name was called Jesus. So the circumcision was the announcement of what his name would be. And there's a reason also why it required eight days before they could do this. But it mentions and it makes reference to why he would be called Jesus, so named of the angel before he was conceived in the womb, which we just read. Now, that week had to transpire. Seven days had to go by before he could be circumcised on the next day, which would be the beginning of the next week. Eight days. And this is where resurrection is hinted at. Now, when we go to the Old Testament and find out why it had to be uh, eight days, we turn to Leviticus and the sec- or the 12th chapter. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If a woman have conceived seed and born a man-child, now this is what happened with Mary, of course, she shall be unclean seven days. Now, we weren't told that in Luke. We were just told that she circumcised the child the eighth day. But it's because she's unclean for seven days. And that uncleanness would disallow her from presenting the child with circumcision. So it would be according to the days of the separation for her infirmity shall she be unclean. And in the eighth day, the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised. So a woman is considered unclean when she gives birth to a child. So eight days had to pass to allow those seven days of purification to go by in which she's unclean. And Remember, the eighth day when Jesus was circumcised was also the day that he was announced and the name was made known. And when we go to Luke, once again, chapter 2, verse 21, when eight days were accomplished for the circumcision of the child, his name was called Jesus. Now, when we look at the resurrection in John chapter 20, in the first verse, the first day of the week cometh Mary Magdalene early when it was yet dark under the sepulcher and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulcher. So Jesus is resurrected. This is the first day. And that was on a Sunday. Jesus arose from the dead on the first day of the week, which would be a Sunday. Kind of like right today is the first day of the week. You can see the parallel happening. And the Hebrew day began on Sunday, the previous day. Like, in other words, Saturday at sundown is when Sunday actually begins, if you're talking about the Hebrew calendar, the first day of the week. They didn't call it Sunday, they just called it the first day of the week, but it began on sundown the previous day. And so in John 20 and verse 19, then the same day at evening, just when the sun's going to go down and then end that day, which would be at sundown, being the first day of the week, When the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in their midst. And he said unto them, Peace be unto you. And when he had said so, he he showed unto them his hands and his side. Then were his disciples glad when they saw the Lord. Then said Jesus to them again, Peace be unto you, as my Father has sent me, even so send I you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and saith unto them, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. Now, they didn't actually receive the Holy Ghost here because Jesus himself says in Acts chapter 1, Go to Jerusalem and wait for the promise of the Father. And that was 40 days after he resurrected. We're reading about what happened the very day he resurrected. So there was this symbolism, this foreshadowing of breathing on them to receive the Holy Ghost. It was kind of like a preview in a sense, a a foreshadow. Whosoever sins you remit, they're remitted unto them, and whosoever sins you retain, they are retained. But look at verse 24. Thomas, one of the twelve called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. And this is all the first day of the week. Thomas wasn't there. And the other disciples therefore said unto him, we've seen the Lord, you know, after this day had gone by. But he said unto them, except I shall see in his hands, the print of the nails, 
put my finger into the print of the nails and thrust my hand into his side, I will not believe. And then we read something after he was resurrected from the dead. We talked about all of these events that happened the day he resurrected. Eight days later, after eight days, the same time after his birth when he was circumcised, eight days, eight days after he resurrected, we read about something happening. Again, his disciples were within. And this time, Thomas was with them. Then came Jesus, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said the same thing all over again, peace be unto you. Then said he to Thomas, and Thomas wasn't even there for Jesus to have heard naturally all these things. He wasn't there when Thomas told them, except I see the nail prints in his hand and put my hand right there inside. I'm not going to believe. And so can you imagine what went through Thomas's mind when Jesus said, reach hither thy finger, behold my hands, reach hither thy hand and thrust it into my side and be not faithless, but believing. He caught even what Thomas had said after he made those statements a week earlier. I won't believe. So then he says, be not faithless, but believe. And Thomas answered and said unto him, my Lord and my God. It's like a revelation came to Thomas when Jesus appeared to him. And not only that, let Thomas know he knew the thoughts of his mind. He was actually watching without physically being there what was happening when the disciples were telling Thomas about Jesus' appearance. So with all of that overwhelming him, he came down, fell on his knees, and he said, my Lord and my God, a revelation had taken place. Eight days after he was risen, he showed himself to Thomas, who didn't believe the words alone. You know, just the words were given from those disciples, the apostles. And Thomas just didn't believe the apostles' words. He had to see it. You see, your heart is the part of you that believes God's word. With the heart, man believeth unto salvation. And when we turn our hearts to Jesus, we read something special in 2 Corinthians chapter 3. And we've been actually ministering a lot about 2 Corinthians chapter 3. But go down to verse 14 and read that people's minds are blinded. For until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. The children of Israel, they don't accept, the ones that aren't Christian, don't accept the New Testament. They only read the Old. But when they stop reading the Old, it says, and their hearts that has that veil on them turns to the Lord in verse 16, the veil is taken away. There is a circumcision that happens when your heart believes on Jesus. And here Thomas hadn't seen Jesus in the resurrected state yet. So what we're seeing is a message that it's the New Testament when Jesus has risen again. You see, the gospel is laid out in the New Testament. And although the Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, those gospels end with the resurrection of Jesus. They're not finished until you do indeed see the resurrection of Jesus. The gospel includes his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And all of that happened at the end of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And the several chapters before that was about the life of Jesus and all that he began to do and teach according to what Acts chapter 1 describes as the gospel of Luke. And it's talking about his whole lifetime but it ultimately leads up to the death and the burial and the resurrection. That is the gospel. And in fact, you read Paul explaining that in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, how that the gospel was preached. If you keep in memory what I preached, Paul said, unto you, unless you've believed in vain, because I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures and he was buried and he rose again the third day according to the scriptures and he talks about all of this and he refers to it as the gospel i declare unto you the gospel which i preached unto you his death his burial his resurrection the third day and so 
The Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all led up to that pivotal point of his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And so here you've got Thomas getting a veil because his heart began believing when he saw the nail prints in his hand and the wound in his side. And a circumcision actually occurred. Just like eight days after Jesus Christ was born, Mary took him the eighth day for there to be a circumcision and the veil of physical flesh from the male is removed. Well, circumcision is that of the heart, the Bible tells us. And you're a Jew when you're physically circumcised outwardly, when flesh is removed, but you're a Jew inwardly when circumcision is made in your heart. And Thomas had his heart unveiled, praise God. And you could say Jesus Christ was unveiled to him. And he was unveiled because Moses, 2 Corinthians chapter 3 tells us, had a veil on his face as he represented the Old Testament, which message was veiled. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 3, we in the New Testament use great plainness of speech, not like Moses who put a veil on his face. And so the face of Moses, the face of the old covenant messenger being veiled, represented the veiled nature of the old covenant. And you've got a heart on your, uh, a veil rather, on your heart, and there's a veil on Moses' face which represents the message of the old covenant. It was veiled. It had truth concealed in it. That's why we've often said that The old covenant is the new covenant concealed. The new covenant is the old covenant revealed. And there's a revel, even the word revelation or revealed means unveiling. Unveiling is what revelation means. And so John tells us about Thomas eight days after Jesus resurrected, had a revelation of Jesus, had an unveiling. And and if the messenger in the old, had a veil on his face, and the servant of the old covenant had a veil on his heart, then what's happening with the messenger is paralleled in the uh, obedient believer of that covenant. Well, in the new covenant, Jesus' face is open and not veiled. That's because our hearts are also unveiled. And here, sure enough, at the end of 2 Corinthians 3, with an open face, not like Moses, Jesus' face is open, it's unveiled. We are beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord. And we're changed into that same image from glory to glory. So just like he said earlier, when your heart turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. We are changed in the same image because Jesus didn't have his face veiled. It was open and unveiled. And for us to be turned in the same image, the veil comes off of our hearts. We become like him. He's not veiled. We're no longer veiled. Our hearts are wide open now. And the old covenant being changed and and giving way to the new covenant. Not that the old was changed in that sense, but a change happened because the old covenant was done away with and the new covenant came in force. So there you see a powerful parallel with the eighth day after Jesus was born. There's an unveiling and his name is made known, Jesus. And That's when his announcement was made, who he was. Jesus means God, my salvation. And Thomas, on the eighth day, sees that announcement and knows that Jesus is Lord. He saw the announcement that Jesus Christ was Lord, physically speaking, in material terms, when Jesus showed him the prints in his hand, showed him the wound in his side, and he became a believer. And it was like Jesus was announced to Thomas at a circumcision of the heart. Praise God. Powerful, powerful. You know, the Bible talks about the spiritual circumcision, even in the Old Testament. It it talked about it. If you go to Deuteronomy and you read the 10th chapter, look at the 16th verse. Circumcise therefore the foreskin of your heart and be no more stiff-necked. Even in Deuteronomy 30 and the 6th verse, And the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart and the heart of thy seed to love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul that thou mayest live. But that wouldn't happen until the New Testament. You know, in Romans 2, I already quoted it, but let's look at it. 
Because when you read it, the word really gets in your heart, which is uncircumcised. Romans 2 and 28. For he is not a Jew, which is one outwardly. Neither is that circumcision, which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew, which is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart. It's in the spirit, not in the letter, whose praise is not of men, but of God. And by the way, when you read about it's in the spirit and not in the letter, we look in Romans chapter 7 and verse 6. We are delivered from the law that being dead wherein we were held that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in oldness of the letter. And even 2 Corinthians 3, seeing that same comparison of the Old Testament called the letter and the New Testament called spirit, 2 Corinthians 3, where we talked about the veil being removed from the heart, says at the very start in verse 3, you are manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshy tables of the heart. You've got written with ink, the letter, old covenant. You've got written with the spirit in the tables of the heart, the new covenant. Even the old covenant was engraved in tables of stone, the Ten Commandments. But God puts his word in our hearts. You are our epistle written in our hearts, Paul said. Us, us apostles have you guys written in our hearts, but we're writing something in your hearts. And it's the epistle of Jesus. And the epistle of somebody is what that person has written. And so he says, Jesus Christ has written in your hearts his epistle. Hallelujah. And it talks about we're not ministers of the letter. He made us able ministers, not of the letter, but of the spirit, which is the new testament so here you've got all of this wonderful picture where when jesus was born he was born under the law so there even he was physically circumcised but when he resurrected from the dead he brought forth the new covenant where we could be circumcised and get a revelation just like his name jesus was announced the eighth day when mary presented him for circumcision the eighth day, Jesus was announced to Thomas, and he said, my Lord and my God. So Jesus isn't just the name Jesus that's getting, being presented to Thomas. It's the fact that Jesus means Lord and God. Hallelujah. Jesus is Lord and God. Amen. And some people think, well, Jesus really wasn't being said to be God when Thomas said it. It's like somebody saying, oh, my God, that doesn't mean what you're looking at is necessarily God. But in this case, it was. It's not like that with Thomas. He was identifying Jesus as Lord and God. What a revelation. Praise God. And of course, we can't go without going by Colossians chapter 2, verse 11 and 12, when we're talking about circumcision, because in whom you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. In putting off the body, you see the flesh from body was removed in natural circumcision. But in this case, it's not f just flesh. It's the body of the sins that are of the flesh. Sins by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God. Isn't that interesting? Oh, God's just showing me something here right now. Jesus Christ was resurrected. And then eight days after he was resurrected, and the Bible actually even calls his resurrection being first born from the dead. The first born from the dead. And that's also in Colossians. When you go to chapter one, and I'll get back to chapter two here in a minute. But when you read chapter one, it talks about him being the firstborn from the dead in verse 18. It's easy, even using his resurrection from the dead and calling it a birth. No wonder his physical birth in Bethlehem had so many references and shadows of his resurrection because it would be a birth from the dead, though. And so now that you've got this happening in Colossians 2, verse 11 to 12, Jesus Christ resurrected, and Thomas saw that in an unveiling of his heart. And he said, my Lord and my God. He was announced to Thomas as Jesus, the Lord and God. Where in the natural circumcision, Jesus' name was announced by Mary to everybody. But, oh, what a greater 
experience of an unveiling. Circumcision is literally an unveiling of the flesh. And here, this unveiling happens, and it happened after Jesus' resurrection with Thomas, but it also connects us. We also are risen with him, risen with him through faith. So there's a resurrection happening in us. When we get our hearts circumcised, folks, there's a resurrection happening to us, which all is wrapped up in Jesus Christ resurrecting and eight days later showing himself to Thomas and I'm resurrected. I really am alive. Thomas said, I'm not going to believe. And Jesus said, well, guess what, Thomas? You're not only going to believe when you see the nail prints in my hands and the wound in my side that I resurrected, but this is going to be a means for you to be able to resurrect because a veil is coming off of your heart and we are circumcised with a circumcision made without hands wherein we are risen with Christ from the dead. See how it's all connecting it all together. Praise God. What a declaration. Now, then there were several more days after Mary saw Jesus Christ circumcised that are associated with events that happened after Jesus' resurrection. When you go back to Luke again and read verse 22, Luke 2 and 22, and when the days of her purification according to the law of Moses, were accomplished. They brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. So now there's more. Remember there was seven days that she was unclean and then the eighth day they'd circumcise him? Well, we read about that in verse 21. Eight days were accomplished. There was a circumcision. But then there were more additional days called the days of her purification. And we're going to take you to the law of Moses because Luke doesn't tell us how many days that was. He doesn't give us how long the days of her purification was in Luke 2. But when they brought him after those days, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord. So let's go back again to Leviticus 12 because that's where you find out how many days there are. Isn't the Bible just wonderful how it all pieces this together? In Luke chapter 12, verse 4, talking about the eighth day, just like Luke 2 did, and then the very next verse, there's more additional days, just like Luke 2 did. The very next verse, she shall then continue in the blood of her purifying three and 30 days. So 33 more days. She shall touch no hallowed thing. That's why she couldn't come to the temple for 33 days after he was circumcised. Nor come into the sanctuary. That actually says it. Until the days of her purifying be fulfilled. So here you're finding why, or you're seeing how many days there was after the circumcision, 33 days. Now the sanctuary that she can't go into is the temple that Mary went after those days of purification were fulfilled so she could present Jesus to the Lord. Before she could do that, you read of two time periods, eight days, to allow her to experience the seven days during her uncleanness. 33 more days for her purification. And then when we go back to Luke again, chapter two, and when the days of her purification were done, she presented them to the Lord, as it is written in the law of the Lord. Now notice this, every male that openeth the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. Now I want you to particularly note those words. He's actually quoting the Old Testament. I'm going to take you to that quote here in a minute. But notice when he's quoting it in Luke, it says, every male that opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. Don't forget that title, holy to the Lord. And then in verse 24, and to offer a sacrifice according to that which is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. Remember that as well. Mary offered a pair of turtle doves and two young pigeons in sacrifice. You don't often hear this when people preach about the birth of Jesus. So to bring sacrifices was necessary for the birth of the child. But she couldn't do that until after seven days plus 33 more days so she could enter the temple. And she was unclean seven days and then she had to be purified for an additional 33 days. And after the seven days, the eighth day, 
the beginning of her additional 33 days, that's when the child was circumcised. So we have to go back again to Leviticus. So Leviticus chapter 12, verse 6. And when the days of her purifying are fulfilled for a son or for a daughter, she shall bring a lamb of the first year for a burnt offering and a young pigeon or a turtle dove for a sin offering unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation unto the priest and who shall offer it before the Lord and look at make an atonement for her. This is vitally important in this message this morning. Don't forget this. An atonement for her. She was unclean. You have to have a sacrifice and you have to have an atonement by that sacrifice because of her uncleanness. And she shall be cleansed from the issue of her blood. That's what the atonement would do. This is the law for her that hath borne a male or a female. And if she be not able to bring a lamb. Now notice in Luke 2, we don't read about Mary bringing a lamb. But if she can't bring a lamb, then she shall bring two turtle doves or two young pigeons. That's what Mary brought. So obviously she was supposed to bring a lamb. But if you're poor and you can't, you can just bring the two turtle doves or the pigeons. The one for the burnt offering, the other for the sin offering. And the priest, again, shall make an atonement for her and she shall be clean. So two turtle doves or two pigeons. Now we don't know until we read Leviticus 12, after reading Luke 2, that if a person couldn't offer a young lamb, then these were allowable because of poverty. So you know what this is telling us? Joseph and Mary were not rich by any means. And that's sad because they came from the tribe of Judah, from the lineage of David, who was king. It was a wealthy family. But that's how far down and degraded the tribe of Judah became. David the king, he had luxury, he was royal. But look at the poverty-stricken state of Mary and Joseph by the time Jesus is born, centuries later. Just like the human race, the family was rich. It was kings. Adam was a king. But because of sin into which Adam went, now the family has gone to poverty. There's even a message there about how Jesus came to bring that back. So she had to go to the temple, offer that sacrifice of atonement for her because of her uncleanness. But that wasn't all. We also read that the male child was called holy to the Lord. Now, let's go to Numbers chapter 3. Who knew there were so many verses in the Old Testament that deal with the time of the birth of Jesus? Numbers chapter 3, verse 13. Because all the firstborn are mine, for on the day that I smote all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, remember the Exodus? I hallowed unto me, all the firstborn in Israel, both man and beast, mine shall they be. I am the Lord. So the firstborn belongs to God. And that's related to the Exodus. Because if you go to Exodus and you read chapter 13 and verse 2, Sanctify unto me all the firstborn, whatsoever openeth the womb among the children of Israel, both of man and of beast, it is mine. Now Luke referred to that very verse in Exodus 13 and 2. Read it again before we go to Luke. Sanctify unto me all the firstborn, whatsoever openeth the womb among the children of Israel, both of man and of beast, it is mine. Notice he says, because it's mine. Well, when you go to Luke, and that's where I told you to remember that he's quoting the Old Testament and I just showed you what verse he was quoting now, Exodus 13 and 2. When you go to Luke 2 and 23, as it is written, for every male that openeth the womb shall be called holy to the Lord. See, Exodus says, it is mine. But Luke says, holy to the Lord. And I don't know if you knew this or not before, but the word holy means belonging to. In Old English, you could say that that purse sitting on that bench is holy to that woman. Now, that doesn't mean that she worships that purse, but it does mean it belongs to her. The old English word holy meant belonging to. So if it's holy to the Lord, then it belongs to the Lord. If it's holy to the Lord in Luke 2 and 23, that's why Exodus chapter 13 says, it's mine. 
Hallelujah. It's mine. And there's a powerful message we're going to bring out as we talk about this. Praise God. Holy means belonging to. Now watch how this works out. So there were three Old Testament laws that we've already showed you that were related to Jesus' birth. Number one, the mother's unclean for seven days. So the next day, the child is circumcised because she's got to bring it to the house of God. Number two, after that seven days, there's 33 more days of a period called purification. And then she offers atonement sacrifice for her uncleanness at the temple. The child is then dedicated to God as the firstborn because God saved it by a lamb back in the Exodus when the firstborn would have died if it hadn't been for the Passover lamb. Are you getting the hint of who Jesus is? The lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world? Hallelujah. So this brings us seven days plus 33 more days, which equals 40 days. Now, a very common Old Testament time period is 40 days. 40 days and nights the rain fell for the flood. 40 days and nights Moses was in the mountain. 40 days and nights Nineveh was going to be destroyed after Jonah preached. Look what happened after these 40 days in Luke chapter 2. Praise God. As we go to Luke chapter 2. We read in verse 25, And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And the same man was just and devout, and he was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Ghost was on him. It was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he wouldn't see death before he'd seen the Lord's Christ or the Messiah. And he came by the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, then took he him up in his arms and blessed God and said, Lord, now let us thy servant depart in peace according to your word. You told me I'd see the Messiah and then I'd die. For my eyes have seen thy salvation. Now notice what he's calling Jesus. Thy salvation. Jesus means God is salvation. And this man took this baby up held him up in the air to God and said, this is your salvation. Now, what did the woman have to do to the baby on the 40 days after, 40th day after his birth? He was the firstborn, so he belonged to the Lord. So she said, this is yours, Lord. I'm giving him to you. Well, here is Simeon holding him up, said, this is yours, God. I'm giving him to you. But he's saying, this is salvation, your salvation. So Jesus is really being announced as the salvation. He is belonging to God. He is God's salvation. What a wonderful truth that God is showing us. Hallelujah. The name Jesus on the eighth day when he was uh, circumcised. And Jesus is unveiled or circumcised or revealed before uh, Thomas, whose heart was circumcised. And Jesus' face was unveiled. Thomas's heart was unveiled. And he saw this circumcision of his heart occur so he could believe. Hallelujah. Wonderful, wonderful. And then when you go back to Luke, which hast prepared before the face of all people. Notice before the face of all the people, it's being revealed. A light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. The man saw God's salvation. He said he saw it. My eyes have seen your salvation. And salvation belonged to God. It's thy salvation, God. It's your salvation. So when something belongs to God, as we've mentioned earlier, it's holy to God. It is mine. It is holy to God. The old covenant said it's mine. The new covenant quote says it's holy. That means it's the same verse being quoted and he's just giving you another translation of the same idea. Holy means it's mine. Hallelujah. And then the name Jesus that was presented to God with the child means God is salvation. He's saying, here's your salvation, God. He's the firstborn. We're giving him to you. Hallelujah. It just is so wonderful all the way around. You see, Jesus is salvation in person. 
He's salvation personified. That's why he came to this world. Simeon didn't know the child's name. He never heard Jesus being spoken, but he fulfilled prophecy because God said, the firstborn belongs to me and you bring him to me and you give him to me on the 40th day after he's born. And his name was Jesus, which means God's salvation. Here's your salvation, God, Simeon said. See the work of prophecy. See the word of knowledge happening. And see the miraculous intervention by God's spirit. He's saying his eyes saw the salvation that belonged to God. Jesus belonged to God. And Simeon was told he would see the Messiah. Forty days after he was born. And that parallels the resurrection. Don't forget about how it parallels the resurrection. Remember the eighth day when Thomas saw Jesus and it's like his heart was circumcised and he believed? Well, 40 days after Jesus' resurrection, we read this in the book of Acts, chapter 1, verse 2, until the day in which he was taken up after Jesus ascended up into heaven. He was taken up into heaven after, through the Holy Ghost, he'd given commandments to the apostles whom he had chosen. He showed himself alive after his passion, being seen to them by many infallible proofs for 40 days. 40 days. There wasn't just something significant after Jesus' resurrection that happened on the eighth day, like Thomas had his heart unveiled circumcised. But on the 40th day, just like Mary took him into the temple, on the 40th day, Jesus ascended up into heaven. Hallelujah. And when he ascended up into heaven, we read in Mark chapter 16, the last chapter, the second last verse, after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and sat on the right hand of God. He went to the throne. On the 40th day, he went into heaven. And he went to the throne in heaven on the 40th day. Now remember, Mary went into the temple on the 40th day to present Jesus and have a sacrifice for atonement. Well, look at this. In Hebrews chapter 9, we read that the high priest in verse 12 goes into the holy place, but Jesus didn't go in by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood. He entered into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. And when you drop down to verse 23, it was necessary that the patterns of the things in the heavens should be purified with these, but heavenly things themselves. You see, what he's saying here is the temple on earth into which the high priest went into its holiest of holies was a pattern of heaven. But look at the next verse. For Christ isn't entered into the holy places made with hands. He didn't go into a temple on earth. Mary went into a temple on the 40th day to present Jesus, the firstborn. And this was God's firstborn, Jesus. Well, Jesus didn't go into a temple made with hands on the 40th day when he ascended up into heaven. He ascended up into heaven on the 40th day. But what did he go into? He went into heaven itself. He went into the real temple. You see, the temple that Mary went into on the 40th day was a shadow and a symbol of the real temple that Jesus would go into 40 days after he resurrected, when he was first born from the dead. He went into the earthly temple when he was born in Bethlehem 40 days after that point, when Mary introduced him and announced him and gave him to God and offered sacrifice for atonement. Well, Jesus went into heaven the real holiest, the real temple on the 40 day, 40th day after his first birth from the dead, being first born. And praise God, folks, wasn't Jesus the atonement sacrifice? And just like the high priest in Hebrews 9 would go in with the blood of goats and calves and, and make atonement in the tabernacle, Jesus doesn't go in with blood of goats and calves. He goes in and puts away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Hallelujah. He goes into heaven itself with his own blood. The high priest entered in every year with the blood of others. Well, he went in with his own blood. And he made atonement for the world, just like Mary had to bring a sacrifice of pigeons and turtle doves as atonement. 40th day after Jesus is born in the temple 
40 days after Jesus is the firstborn from the dead in resurrection, goes up into heaven, and he's the atonement sacrifice for the sins of the world. She was unclean for all of those 39 days. And on the 40th day, she went in, had the sacrifice for uncleanness. Well, Jesus went into heaven and took the blood of his sacrifice, made atonement in the holiest of holies for the sins of the whole world that were unclean. We all were unclean. Amen. And in closing, I want you to see this. All the kingdom emphasis. Because look what happened at his birth. Oh, thank you, Jesus. You see, he came to be king. And that already happened. In Luke 1 and verse 31, we read, Behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, Gabriel told Mary, bring forth a son. You will call his name Jesus. He's going to be great. He's called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. This was announced before the birth of Jesus. The throne of his father David and he shall reign over the house of Jacob. And when you go to Acts chapter 2 and you read Peter's sermon and you go to verse 33, we read, Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he hath shed forth this which you now in see and hear. He's at that throne. He's at that throne of David. And just in case people don't think that's the throne of David, because it's in heaven, look what he said a little earlier. He said in verse 30, speaking of David in verse 29, David was a prophet, not just a king knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his loins, according to the flesh, he would raise up Christ to sit on his throne. Well, that's why verse 33 says, Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, he's received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost. He's on that throne. He's on that throne. Hallelujah. Because he's on that throne, Paul, Peter said the Holy Ghost is coming down. So the kingship that he was spoken about to experience and receive before his birth, he got that when he entered heaven and sat on that throne. Remember the holiest of holies on the earth had the Ark of the Covenant with the mercy seat on it? Well, if heaven is the real temple, the real holiest of holies, and Jesus went into heaven in the real holiest, and he went and sat on the right hand of God, that mercy seat on the ark represents the throne that Jesus sat on. In other words, he's king. That's why all of this, these words of his kingship when he was born parallel his resurrection because that's when he went into heaven 40 days after his resurrection and ruled as king of kings and lord of lords ever since. And in the book of Acts, they said, hey, Israel, and its leaders were talking to the Roman government. These Christians, there's another way that they're teaching, which is contrary to what we believe. They're talking about another king, namely Jesus. Another king, namely Jesus. That's what the early church preached, King Jesus. Hallelujah. And Zacharias, the, son, the father of John the Baptist, in chapter 1 of Luke, Verse 59, look what Zacharias said in a prophecy. Praise God. It came to pass on the eighth day, they came to circumcise. This is John the Baptist. When John the Baptist was circumcised, there's a message here about the eighth day of John the Baptist circumcision. They called him Zacharias after the name of his father. And his mother answered, said, not so, but he shall be called John. And they said unto her, there's none of that kindred that's called by that name. You, nobody in your family is called John. And they made signs to his father how he would have, ha have him called. And he asked for a writing table and wrote saying his name is John. And they marveled all. And then as soon as John was written by Zechariah, his mouth was open immediately and his tongue loosed. And he prophesied as he spoke and praised God. Look what he said. Everybody had fear come on them. And all these sayings were noised abroad. And all they that heard him 
laid them up in their hearts, saying, What man of child this be? And the hand of the Lord was with him. And Zechariah was filled with the Holy Ghost, and he prophesied, saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people. He raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. That's Jesus he's talking about. He spake by the mouth of his holy prophets since the world began about this one, that we should be saved from our enemies, from all the hand of those that hate us, to perform the mercy promised to our fathers. Remember his holy covenant, the oath which he swore to our father Abraham. He grant unto us that we'd be delivered out of the hand of our enemies and serve him without fear in holiness. We would serve him in holiness, in righteousness. We would serve him in righteousness all the days of our lives. And thou, child, shall be called the prophet of the highest, for thou shalt go before the face of the Lord. Talking about John the Baptist now, where he just finished talking about Jesus. All these kingship references, and even the shepherds in Luke chapter 2, and you read in the 8th verse, there were in the same country shepherds. They were keeping watch over the flock. The angel of the Lord came on them, and the glory of God shone. And it told them, I bring you good tidings of great joy. Unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, Christ, Messiah, the Lord. And they were told about the Lord, the Lord, hallelujah. And we read where Simeon lifted up and said, Mine eyes have seen your salvation, a light to lighten the Gentiles. There was Anna who spoke of redemption in Israel to look for Jesus. All of this was the kingship of Jesus Christ. And also... There's more in Matthew chapter 2. In closing, I bring you to this chapter. Jesus was born in Bethlehem. And then wise men came from the east to Jerusalem, saying, where is he that's born? King of the Jews. The king. We've come to see the king. In his first time he was born in Bethlehem, born of a womb of a mother. He was prophesied to be king. He was told he would rule. And then, praise God, the shepherds were told about him. There's going to be peace on earth from his kingdom. The Messiah, the Lord. Hallelujah. And, and Zechariah prophesied about his kingship, delivering us from the hands of all of our enemies. Amen. And the last enemy was death, and he delivered us from death. All of this. And the eighth day, Mary brings him to be circumcised, and his name's announced. Well, all of that foreshadows the resurrection, when he was first born from the dead. The spiritual nativity. I'm talking about the spiritual nativity from the grave. First born from the dead. When Thomas, eight days later, has a circumcision and sees Jesus as Lord. When 40 days added to those 33 days and the seven days to begin with after the resurrection. When Mary took him into the temple and had atonement and gave him to God as the firstborn? Well, in the 40 days, Jesus goes into the real temple of heaven and makes atonement for us like a high priest sprinkling blood on the mercy seat. But this high priest, Jesus, sits on the mercy seat. No high priest did that in the Old Testament like our high priest. Jesus sat there and he's priest on his throne, Zechariah prophesied. All of this because the kingdom of God has come. Before the cross, Jesus said, pray thy kingdom come. But it's after the cross now, folks. It's after the 40 days when he resurrected, ascended into heaven and sat on the throne. And he's on the throne now. And his kingdom has come. And you know the only thing we need to pray when we say that thy kingdom come? Let it come through us because it's here now. It just needs to come through you. It needs to come through me. Folks, aren't you glad Jesus is born king of Israel? king of the world, king of kings, and Lord of lords. And we're in his kingdom now. I hope this message has blessed you. Watch it again, because we covered a lot of those parallels. And if you'd like to get this in my book, I wrote The Spiritual Nativity, The Resurrection, Jesus Christ, and The Spiritual Nativity. And you could get it at Amazon. God bless you so much. Amen and amen.